comfortable. They become comfortable with the world in which they're living. And they don't really want to go back to the place where they used to be. And instead they settle for where they are. Well, in the midst of this time frame, God allows the story of Esther to take place. And I want to be real clear about this because this is why it's so important that I feel like God put this on my heart. I began to see as the Lord put this one word, this one phrase on my heart for such a time as this. That's what kept ringing in my spirit for such a time as this. And as I began to study the book of Esther, I began to realize that at least what the Lord was showing me was that I began to see a prophetic outline or a synopsis, if you will, of God's kingdom. So without the whole, throughout the whole book of Esther, I want to tell you a little bit about the story of Esther, but I also want to bring to you through this story, a prophetic timeline. I believe that God, see, this is what I understand about God and his word. God is the greatest author that has ever lived. And he can use illustration and allegory in order to speak. His word of God is like a, is so deep that you keep pull, peeling back layers and peeling back layers. And you can never exhaust the word of God. And the little bit that we have an understanding of, there's so much more there. But I need you to understand this morning that I'm believing that the book of Esther describes a prophetic timeline of the church age. But then moving into the changes that are going to take place. Right. Hallelujah. The idea is that last week we saw the truth that a queen or a bride was called her name was Vashti and and but she didn't want to come but yet at the same time there was another bride another queen that ended up being called her name was Esther she responded to the call of the king and we took from that and we preached from that the truth that during this time known as the church age the call is going forward but not everyone called will come that's why I have John chapter 12 verse 37 up look at this but though he had done so many miracles before them, talking about Jesus, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and he spoke of him. One of the things that the Lord has revealed to me is that it's not your job, son, in order to cause. You're not the Lord of the harvest. Right. He said, I've called you to sow seed and I've called you to water seed and you have called to work in union with me to yoke up with me. I am the Lord of the harvest. You do what I've called you to do, amen, and let me be left up to the rest. Listen to me, child of God. Some people are not going to choose Jesus Christ as their king. The call is going forward, but some people will not respond to the call. Lord, help us to be like Esther. Help us to have the grace that we need in order to respond to the call. Listen. We're about to get into a scripture out of Esther that talks about the fact that she received favor and grace in the sight of the king. I want you to take a look with me. If you have your Bibles at home, if you got a notebook, you should go ahead and take some notes. You should go ahead and turn with us in your Bible. I hope you can see this on the screen that I'm trying to, to, to do for you. I did. We, we kind of worked all this out so that you can hopefully see the scriptures on the screen. But look at Psalm 5, chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to talk to you right now specifically about the favor of the Lord. Because I want you to understand how the favor of the Lord works. Amen. Look at Psalm 5 and 12. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. Amen. With favor wilt thou compass him, compass him as a shield. God wants to surround his people like a shield of protection. The favor of the Lord wants to bless the righteous. Listen to me, child of God. New Testament theology teaches us that righteousness comes through the shed blood of a lamb that was without sin. Hallelujah. God's plan of salvation began all the way from the beginning of the garden. We're about to get into it. All the way to the end and in the end of the book of Revelation where the word of God calls him the lamb seven different times. And this is after the enemy has been thrown into Gehenna, which is the 
last death. He's still known as the Lamb of God. I personally believe he will always bear those nail scars and the scar in his side because that is who he is. He's the resurrected Savior. He's the first one born from the dead. And it will be written even in the times of the millennial reign as those that don't have glorified bodies are commingled with those that do have glorified bodies. That's what I'm seeing through the word of God. That's what's going to happen. And that those with glorified bodies will teach those that don't have glorified bodies. And it'll be the same message then that it is today that it was in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. That salvation had to come through the shedding of innocent blood because there were those that were guilty. Hallelujah. It had to be redeemed from their sinfulness. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful plan that you have engaged us in. Amen. That is a truth that God's people have enjoyed. Great favor and grace from God. Nevertheless, God's people have also experienced great sorrow and tribulation. And the last days of God's kingdom will also be filled with sorrow and pain. And in the midst of all of that, also God's grace and favor. Soon this story will shift. I'm talking about the story of Esther. It will shift and will introduce a man named Haman, who like Pharaoh, Goliath, and Nebuchadnezzar, is a type of the Antichrist and his system that attempts to destroy the people, and the plan of God. I want to talk to you a little bit. We're going to Esther chapter 2, verse, Esther chapter 2, verse 17. Amen. I want to talk to you a little bit still about the favor of God on the life of the believer. Because listen, Esther is the one who responds to the call of the king. Amen. It says, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight. More than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. See, to this point, Esther underwent a ritual. We learned about this last week. She underwent a ritual for six months. The cleansing, a cleansing purification ritual where for six months she underwent being anointed with myrrh. One of the things that we know from the scriptures is that myrrh represents death to some extent. Why does it do that? Because that is what they used to embalm dead bodies. That's part of what they used in the preservation of Jesus. That's one of the gifts that was given to Jesus by the wise men. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, all representative of the calling on his life that he would be a high priest, that he was the king of kings, and hallelujah, that he was born to die. That was the purpose that he was born for, was to die to set us free from the bondage of sin. So she underwent this period of purification through this myrrh, but then there was another six months where she was anointed with sweet fragrances. I got good news for you, child of God. Because listen, yes, the cross is an instrument of death. And Romans chapter 6 says that the believer dies with Christ upon faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The believer dies with Christ. He's buried with Him. But hallelujah, that's not the end of the story. You're resurrected to newness of life and you have access to grace. And then the power of the Holy Ghost flowing in your life, strengthening you, hallelujah, and encouraging you to walk walk this thing out. See, the symbolism here describes the conversion of the Christian. More explicitly, once again, that myrrh and that resurrection, that sweet fragrance represents the grace and favor that flows through Christ into the believer's life. I want to take just a moment to say this, that God has a plan of love and forgiveness for the human race. He covers his people with divine grace and favor in order to have this plan move forward. Listen, there's going to be a turn soon in the story where God's people will be persecuted. And God is positioning Esther for her purpose. And the purposes of God are always surrounded and connected to his plan of salvation for the world. And ultimately his reception of glory. God has put us on this earth to be vessels that would reveal glory unto him. And not that we would just live for our own selves. Lord help us. In a similar way to God's positioning of Joseph in Egypt to prevent destruction of his plan. He's doing the same with Esther in order to preserve his people so that his plan can move forward and his will can be done. Before we get started, I want you to understand that God's favor is connected to our trust in his plan for man. That plan has always been connected to the promised seed and sacrifice provided by God. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 4 real quick. Genesis 4, verse 4. How are we doing with our sound over there? Are we okay? Still having a little problem. Well, then it's not. I don't. 
Maybe set All right. Maybe it's or not. Maybe just turn it on and use a regular mic. Okay. Well, where's the mic? But we just want we want people to be able to hear what we're doing. We're just going to use the mic. We're going to turn this microphone off, and we're going to use a regular mic, and we're just going to see what happens here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We on? No. No. Okay. Just bear with us. Technical difficulties. We want it to work. We're just trying to figure it out. Maybe that mic isn't working. Maybe we need to get more high tech. Is this on now? Hello? Y'all hear me? All right. Praise God. Let me know if that works better. Just give me a thumbs up emoji back there if you, if you get some awesome <laughs> feedback. All right? Look at this. Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. It says, And Abel, he also brought of the firstling. We're talking about the favor of God on the life of the believer. You ready? Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect. Other translations will tell you the Lord had favor towards Abel's offering. The Lord shows favor towards those that are willing to put their faith in the right object. Mankind born in sin, born of Adam, is born separated from God, but God has a plan, and it was a lamb. Hallelujah. And this first lamb turned, is, is a type of the, of the Christ that would come, hallelujah, and offer his life as a sacrifice. But unto Cain, he did not show respect because Cain wanted to offer up the works of his own hand. God is all about a peace offering, but you're not going to have peace with God till you go through the shedding of blood first. You're not going to get into the Holy of Holies till you first do your, your business at the brazen altar where the sacrifice is offered. You want favor from God, then you need to put faith in Christ. And that's been the plan. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. You ready? We're just talking about the word of God right now. Talking about favor because, see, Esther received favor from God. Look at verse 17. Chapter, Matthew 3, verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son upon whom my favor rests. In him I am well pleased. Listen to me. You, this might mess up your theology. I don't know, but the Lord spoke to my heart one time and he said, I'm not well pleased with Matt outside of my son. Matt cannot do enough works in the kingdom of God to ever please me. The only one that was ever pleasing to me was my son Jesus because he always did, hallelujah, what he was called to do. And now through faith in Christ, the old man born of Adam has died. A new man has been resurrected and now I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And whenever the Father views me, he views me as as righteous because I've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus and now the favor of God yeah. hallelujah rests upon me Esther represents the New Testament believer in that she receives grace and favor from the king because she's a type of the believer that has placed faith in God's plan which is trusting in Jesus and the sacrifice that he provided when he died for us on the cross amen y'all ready there's point number one God uses his people to protect his purposes of his kingdom. Now, I got to tell you that there was a time in the past, and we're in Esther chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 21. There was a time in the past that I had a conversation, not important with who, but he was a leader. And I had been consistently talking about the importance of the purity of the gospel. I'm sorry. God is not okay with us diluting the gospel. He's not okay with us changing his word. It's his word, not man's word. He wants the leader, he wants the preacher to dig into his word and to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to him the truth of what he's been speaking and to give that to his people because they're his sheep. Right. They're not the preacher's sheep. They're the, they're the sheep of the good shepherd. Come on. Hallelujah. He, does, he doesn't want to hire hirelings. He wants to hire under shepherds. That, that, that will come into to work with him and to present his word to his people. Amen. He said, if you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. So I want you to know that whenever I was in this conversation, this particular leader said, you know, sometimes I feel like you feel like you got to defend the gospel. The Lord has not taught me that I have to defend the gospel. The gospel is big enough to defend itself. I said, well, brother, that's not what the word of God says. We're going to get into that in just a moment. Don't get me wrong. God's going to take care of his gospel. He doesn't need little old Matt to do the job for him. Nevertheless, he's called his people that are called by his name to allow the gospel to live on the inside of them and to preserve the gospel in them. Through the ages, people have given their life 
for the truth of the gospel. Amen. Look at Esther chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. Mordecai right here is going to be a type of the believer that, perver that preserves the king's kingdom. Amen. Look at this. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains or servants, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door were raw, for they were angry. They, they, they were fueled with anger and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now listen, I think we got one more installment to this series. And next week, I want to remind you of this, that it was written in the Chronicles of this king. I'm not talking about the Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible, but in the Chronicles of these Persian kings, it was written down for remembrance. Because God's always working on your behalf. i got to tell you, you just got to trust me. Next week, when we do the last installment, you're going to see God is working in advance on your behalf. People may be trying to trap you. People might be trying to mess you up and throw a stumbling block in your way. But I'm here to tell you that God is on your side. Hallelujah. He is your defender. He is your strong tower. He is your refuge. And he's already working behind the scenes when you can't see him working. Amen. Amen. These men wanted to kill the king and disrupt his kingdom. The same is true for the forces of darkness. They want to destroy the works and the plans of God. There's an ongoing attempt by Satan to change the context of God's word. Little by little, through newer translations and seeker-sensitive dilution of God's word to make sure we don't offend people, the enemy is trying to destroy the kingdom of God, and God uses men and women of the faith to contend for the faith. In this turn in the story, Mordecai represents the believer that does the right thing to protect the king and his kingdom. This part of the purpose that God has placed in the hands of believers on earth, both in the old and in the new covenants. God has placed his people on this earth to represent him and his word. It could be said that we are used in a sense that his word would be preserved in us for the world to see that it's true. You ready? Jude chapter 1. Verse 3, I'm using a lot of scripture this morning. I hope you're with me. I would like to use the scripture to back up what we're talking about here. Amen. Because we're not going to preach something that you can't prove out the Bible. Amen. Allegory is fine. Illustration is fine. But if it can't be backed up, then we got a problem, right? We're not preaching the truth. It says right here in verse 3, Beloved, this is Jude, the Lord's brother, one page, one chapter letter. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. This word contend means, if you were going to read it out of the Greek, it's apagonize. Agonizomai, basically where we get the word agony from. It's talking about contention. It's talking about a wrestler. A wrestling match where there's a contention that's taking place. The main point that you need to understand is, is that you can't fight the forces of darkness, but you need to understand that you are in a warfare against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And the enemy of your soul desires to destroy the word of God in your life through, like I said, through newer translations or seeker-sensitive preachers that stand behind pulpits and won't speak the truth to God's people so that they can be prepared to know what it is that they're facing. Oh, we're not done yet. Let's look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 4. He says, I charge thee therefore before God, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the young pastor Timothy, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The word doctrine is not a bad word, church. It simply means instruction, yeah. the instruction of God. Yeah. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But look at this. Instead, they will, after their own lusts, heap, in other words, make piles to themselves of teachers because they have itching ears. The idea there is that they want pleasant words. Right. Speak pleasant words to me. Speak words that make me feel good, preacher. The word of God will make you feel good when your heart is right 
with the Lord. Amen. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. Lord, help us in this time. Mordecai is a type of the believer and he's protecting king and kingdom. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. It says it right here. Now the spirit, not Matt, the preacher, not, not Brother Kirk, the, 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 the prophetic anointed. No, no, no. The spirit expressly says this, that in latter times, some shall depart. It means that they're going to walk away from. I'm sorry, Christian. You can't walk away from something that you were never part of. So that tells me that there's danger in losing your salvation. They were, if they were never connected, they couldn't walk away from it. Amen. It says they will depart from the faith. Why? Because they gave heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Oh, Lord, help us. Let us be aware that the forces of evil desire to ruin and to corrupt the word of the Lord. We know that he doesn't win in the end. Hallelujah. Because he told Peter, he said, he said that upon this rock, upon this true revelation that you have received, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going back to Esther. Thank you, Jesus. Esther chapter three. We'll get into that in a second. But listen, I want you to know that up to this point in the story, We've seen a connection to the church age. The way I see it is that from the beginning of the story, the king held a feast. We learned that. And he invited his bride to come, but she refused to come. And instead, what did she do? Do y'all remember from last week? She celebrated her own feast. I'm, I would imagine if I had to, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But I would imagine that if I would have been there, her feast probably looked dearly close to what his feast looked like. I would imagine that both of the feasts look like, you know, a feast. Might have been hard to determine the difference between the two if you weren't really looking. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that they're, just because it calls itself the church doesn't mean that it's the church. Just because they're saying that they're preaching the word doesn't mean that it's really the word. Instead, she celebrated her own feast. And from that standpoint, there was a decree that went forth that the king would find himself a bride that wanted to love him and wanted to serve him. And from there, we see the truth of the church age. Once again, I know I'm repeating myself, that the call of God has been going forth along the way. There have been some that have heeded the call and others that have rejected the call. And we also, in the life of Esther, see the importance of hearing the voice of God and having a teachable spirit. Remember that? She listened to her cousin Mordecai. He told her not to reveal who she was, who her people were until the appointed time. It's about to be the appointed time. It's about to rise up and it's about time to speak. Not to keep your mouth shut. There's a time to be quiet. There's a time to stand up and to speak. Hallelujah. But there is coming a day when there will be a great shift in the world. This world will be so drastically changed that it will look nothing like it did previously. Enter the introduction of a new character. Remember, we have some characters here. And originally, our characters, the way that they, that they played out was that King Ahasuerus represented the king. He had a kingdom. He represents Jesus, the king of kings and the lord of lords, right? Mm -hmm. we, had the, the, we had Vashti. She was the one that heard the call, but she refused to come. We have Esther. She represents the child of God that hears the call and submits themselves to the plan of God and willingly comes to the to the to, to bow themselves to the will of God. We have Mordecai, and in the last part of the story, he represented the spirit of God that would lead and guide Esther in the right direction. But now we have the introduction of a new character. His name is Haman, mm -hmm. and Haman represents a type of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Point number two is this. You ready? When the spiritual climate changes. Esther chapter 3. This is a long point. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of scripture connected to this point. Just bear with me because I'm making a, I'm, 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 I'm going somewhere with this. Amen? Okay. Point number 2. When the spiritual climate changes. Esther chapter 3 verses 1 through 2. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman for the king had so commanded concerning him. But look at this. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did did him did him did, did he give him reverence. 
Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for this was his matter. He told them that he was a Jew. Now I want to tell you something, that the landscape in this story is changing rapidly. You cannot... You can't make this stuff up. You ready for this? This is why you got to study the word of the Lord. The name Haman, I mean, I would try to click on it for you, but they told me that they couldn't see it too well when I clicked on my Strong's last week, so I'm not going to do it, okay? <laughs> but the name Haman literally means the magnificent, all right? Now just hold on to me because it gets even better than that. The terminology Agagite, you know what that means? It means, this is what it means right here. I put it in my notes. I will over. Top. We still good on sound? We still doing good on sound? All right, listen. The magnificent one says in his heart, I will overtop. The liar Lucifer said in his heart that I will ascend myself above the throne of God. You can't make this stuff up. Haman the Agagite is a type of the Antichrist. And listen to what he's saying. He's saying, you will bow down and you will reverence me. And you, if you do not listen to the commands of the king, there's going to be trouble to pay. There's going to be a problem. You will bow down and you will surrender. And Mordecai said, no, I won't. Mordecai God said, no, I won't. And the reason that I won't is because I'm a Jew. Uh -huh. Well, what does being a Jew have anything to do with the king's law? Because I am a child of the Holy One of Israel. And I've had a cloud of witnesses that have gone before me. And they said, no, we will not bow. Hallelujah. There's been times in the past and there will be times in the future where the child of God will be faced with situations. Oh, preacher, what you trying to say? The coronavirus is the end. That's not what this preacher's saying. As a matter of fact, I was reading about the 1918 Spanish flu this morning. 40 million people died in 1918 from the Spanish flu. But what I will tell you is this. Child of God, don't stay so focused on the coronavirus that you don't look elsewhere on other things that are happening. Right. You better keep your eyes open. Right. You better right. keep your ears open. Yeah. Because let me tell you something. I'm not here to preach on the Illuminati. I'm not here to preach on the New World Order. But I'm telling you one thing that I've learned is this. That the lies of Satan will use a cover in order to slip Look something it. else in oh. on you. We're going to talk about some of that next week. Listen to me. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. And look out on what's ahead in the horizon. Help us, Lord. I want to talk to you a little bit because listen to this. The king elevated this Haman. The king elevated this Haman. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. When I say we're going to talk about the Illuminati, I'm going to talk to you about things out of straight out of Scripture mm -hmm. that describe the plans of the enemy. Let me make that clear. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Now, first of all, I want you to know right now I'm just talking to you about the line of the tribe of Judah. Because I just get excited. When I read Scriptures that talk about Jesus... <laughs> I can't pass those up to get you to the place where I want to get you to. I actually want to get you all the way to Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. But I can't go there without exposing Jesus. I want to talk about his goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at this right here. Verse 1. I saw in the right hand that, of him that sat on the throne a book yes. written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So here we see the introduction of the seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. John the revelator is weeping in his vision of heaven. Why? Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Why would you weep, John? Because listen, when you get down to where they break open the seals, it's nothing but sorrow and pain and tribulation. Why would you be weeping because the seals can't be opened? Wouldn't you be happy, John, that the seals weren't open? No, I'm not happy because I'm the beloved of the Lord. And I know that at some point in time, the seals have to be opened because it's written. And until the seals are open, the end cannot come. And until the end comes, the final age cannot come when Jesus rules and reigns on the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. His people are crying out, come, Lord, come. May your will on earth, uh, 
may your will on earth be done as it is in heaven. There's no rebellion in heaven right now, child of God. The true child of God longs for the will of God, whatever that will may be. Something it's not always an easy walk in the park. Even whenever there's grace and there's favor flowing in the life, hallelujah, sometimes there's hard times. That's why he's weeping because he wants the will of the Father to be done. He says, don't weep. Why? Because behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Listen to me. There's so much truth in that. Just, just those two little verses of scripture right there. Just those two little phrases. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. I don't have time to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. I believe it is when Jacob laid hands on his sons and said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. In other words, the king's staff will rest in the hand of the, of the seed of Judah, which ultimately was David, which ultimately was Jesus. And hallelujah, he prevailed. Amen. He prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. See, I'm looking for a lion, and what I see is a lamb, as though it had been slain. Having seven horns, the horn in the, in the scripture describes power and authority. Seven is the number of God's fulfillment, is the completion of power, and rests in Him and Him alone. The seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, listen to me, the lamb, the sacrificed one, hallelujah, is, he's the, is the lion and the spirit, listen, the cross, the lamb, and the spirit of God working in conjunction with one another, proper faith is, has to rest in Jesus Christ and him crucified, I'm talking about, listen to me, yes, be prayed up, yes, pray in the spirit, building up your most holy faith, yes, Come to church when you can come to church. Yes, tune in when you can tune in. Yes, read your scripture. Yes, confess scripture. Yes, quote scripture. But if you think that you doing all of that is what gives you access to the power of the Holy Ghost moving and operating in your life, no, sir, no, ma'am. It's proper faith in the eternal plan of God from the beginning whenever he clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of an innocent animal all the way to the end of the book of Revelation when he still called the lamb. Seven times. Keep your faith squarely placed because you know what it does? It gives you righteousness. Amen. Yes. That's what justification means. Yes. That's what justification yes. means. It means to be declared righteous by God. He sure ain't declaring you righteous on your own wor works. Amen. Lord, help us. He's declaring you righteous on the work of the Master, on the work of Jesus, who said it is finished. It is a completed work. God wants to allow His grace to flow in your life. Amen. Amen. Verse 7, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Hallelujah. During the time frame of the church age, the call has gone forth. The power of God has been with his church. The line of the tribe of Judah prevailed over the serpent and the, the devil. And the way that it was done was through the offering of himself as a lamb. And during that church age, all those that were called by his name and humbled themselves to the plan of God were empowered to do the work and the will of God on earth. The Lamb purchased the souls of men. The Lamb gave His life so people could live with God for eternity. And the message of the Lamb went forth. And the call was made for sinners to come. And the Esthers heeded the call. And the Vashtis rejected the call. And now the end of the age is here in this chapter of Revelation. And now it's time for the seals to be opened. And they must be opened because as part of God's plan, in order for there to be a millennial reign of Christ, there must first be great tribulation released upon the earth. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. There must be this last time of pain and sorrow, of great tribulation. It must be because it's written. It must take place. And the only one who is worthy to open and release the seals is the lamb who was slain. Yes. So what are you saying, preacher? Are we in it? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell you, though, it's going to look something like this. It's going to be worse than this, probably. Amen. Lord, help us. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or fragrances, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Hallelujah. Saying you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for you were slain and you've been redeemed. You, you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us unto our God kings and priests 
that we shall reign on the earth. One day you're going to rule and reign with your king. Hallelujah. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. He's worthy. Amen. Is he worthy in your life? Hallelujah. Now listen, we're going to fast forward to chapter six because this is where I was trying to bring you. I had to, had to exalt the lamb though. Amen. You ready? I'm going to exalt the lamb. I'm just going to talk real quick about this Haman. You ready? Because listen to me in the story of where we are in Esther. This is why this is a prophetic timeline. This is why this is an outline to explain to you that the, the, the kingdom age and what's going on here is that this Haman is a type of antichrist. He was elevated by the king and he demanded that people worship him and bow down before him. It says in chapter six, verse one, and I saw when the lamp opened one of the seals. This is the first seal that's open. You ready? And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I don't have time to really break this down, but I'm just going to say a couple of things real quick. First of all, this cannot be Jesus because Jesus comes back in Revelation 19 at the end of the age. Then he's riding on a horse, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. On his thigh, it's written, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's riding on a white horse. He's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood because he is the lamb that now is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not coming into town riding lowly on a donkey. He's coming back like the king of kings riding on a white stallion. There's a sword that protrudes out of his mouth through which he will slay the nations that have tried to overcome the will of God and the kingdom of God. That's at the end of the age. This is the beginning. The beginning of the tribulation. But he's on a white horse. He's a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit Christ. He's an anti-Christ. He's the opposite of. He's got a bow, but he has no arrows. He's coming with peace in his mouth. But his peace that he speaks is a lie of peace. It's just like the lies that are spoken in the world today that say, Oh, we just need to all coexist. We need to all coexist. We need to all be okay with everybody's belief. Listen, I ain't trying to change your belief if you don't want your belief changed. But if you're going to ask me whether or not I think it's okay for you to put your faith in Buddha, then no, I'm not going to tell you that because that's not what the Word of God tells me. Buddha never died on the cross for your sin. Buddha's bones are still in Vietnam. You can go and see them. I'm here to tell you you won't find Jesus' bones because he conquered death, hell, and the grave. He paid the penalty for sin. Hallelujah. And he resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. So there's lies that are spoken and he's going to come saying that he's coming in peace. But his peace is a, are the peace of lies. It's going to result. But he's given a crown. He was given authority. Just like Haman was given authority by the king of that day, this, this king is given a Stephanos, the victor's crown. He's given a time where he can go forth and he can conquer. And once this seal is open, you see other seals that follow. The red horse, which is wars and rumors of wars. The, 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 the green horse, which is death. And in the midst of all of that, there's famine and there's pestilence. And there's all kinds of things that are happening. I believe there will be a time of sorrow and tribulation on this earth before the rapture takes place. Listen to me, child of God. I hope I'm not messing up your theology with this either. Listen. I feel like the Lord has been putting it on my heart for quite some time. And I'm not talking about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I'm not even talking about that right now. What I'm trying to tell you that this scripture describes a world leader that is a counterfeit. And I'm here to tell you that he's coming at the beginning of this period. And I'm here to tell you that he will deceive the world. And, and in order, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, they say peace and safety and then sudden destruction will come upon them. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that for them, to anybody to be willing to sign a peace agreement in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, there's going to have to be chaos in order for them to want to sit. To, to, to receive peace to begin with. And Daniel clearly 
literally says that in the midpoint of that seven year period is when the peace treaty is broken. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that in order for the world to cry out and say, give us peace, there's going to have to be chaos and confusion right. upon the earth. And listen to me, child of God, the apostle Paul got his head cut off. All right. Mark was drugged behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt. Thomas was run through with a Brahmin sword. Don't tell me that the children of God may not have to face some things. We have been, you know what we've been doing? Listen to me. We've been sitting back in the American church eating cotton candy with our feet up. Thinking that nothing ever could touch us because we were Americans. Listen to me, child of God. We better get a hold of it. We better realize, yes, you might get sick. Yes, you might die. Yes, you might be persecuted one day, even unto death. But hallelujah, is there not a cause like King David said when he showed up on the battlefield and he saw that lion giant speaking fear into the children of God? Is there not a cause? Is the king not worthy to be exposed to this lost and dying world? Help us, Lord. He had a bow but no arrows and a crown. So like Haman, he was given authority by the king to exert power over people. Oh, help us, Lord. Scripture says in Matthew chapter 24. Got a lot of scripture today. Matthew 24, 4. He says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Don't let commotion enter into your spirit. Don't be agitated and stricken with fear. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And these, look at this, are the beginning yep. of sorrows. Mm -hmm. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Boy, I could really go somewhere with this, but I don't have time. <laughs> Listen to me. All I'm trying to say is, is that just please do me one favor. If before you turn the channel, let me just say this one thing. Quit thinking that just because you're an American, you're automatically safe. That's the only point that I'm trying to ask you to do. Because they had Syrian Christians three years ago when all that ISIS stuff was happening. that refused to denounce the name of Jesus and they threw them in cages and they lit them on fire. What, they didn't love Jesus? I'm just trying to speak the truth. Come on. I'm just trying to speak the truth, child of God. Help us, Lord. All right. Amen. We're currently facing some things in this world unlike anything this generation has ever faced. I don't know what it was like during the polio epidemic. I don't know what it was like during the Spanish influenza of 1918. But I'm sure that fear was rampant and that the authorities that be were trying to restrict people's movement. And there is a part of wisdom that says be precautious. Use wisdom. I'm going to be clear with this. Don't be an arrogant fool. Right. The authorities are asking for our assistance in helping contain the virus. And there's a part and duty to people to comply with the requests of authorities because God has instituted the power of authorities on earth. The scriptures tell God's people to obey the authorities that have been put in place. We're just bringing some balance. Work, work with me here. Romans chapter 13. This is the scripture. Amen. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. You ready? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. In other words, you ought not be driving down the road with your suspended license and drugs in your pocket and breaking the law and now you're mad at the authorities. No, don't be mad at the authorities. Don't resist them. The Lord put them there. They don't bear the sword. It goes on to say in verse 4, in vain. In other words, the reason he got a sidearm is because society is corrupt and society is... But listen to me. Do we not know that the authorities can be corrupt at times? Of course they can. And that's where my next question I have a question. What begins to happen in an environment when the authorities keep taking away more and more civil liberties? Ooh. What happens in a world where you are instructed to no longer congregate in the name of Jesus, even though the word of God says forsake not the gathering of the brethren? 
What happens when we're faced in a situation where the authorities tell us to socially distance ourselves so that we don't get sick? When the word of the Lord says, when anyone is sick among you, call the elders of the church and pray and anoint the sick with oil. What happens when in the midst of social distancing, they say to stay further than six feet away? And the word of the Lord says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Don't worry. I'm not going to run out there and start kissing on y'all. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm not trying to incite rebellion over here. I want to respect the authorities. I want to respect my fellow human. But when that respect starts to supersede the respect of my God and calls into question what God has called me to do for the gospel's sake, now I'm starting to have a problem. Listen to me. I'm about to put my other little cap on for a second because as of right now, I'm still in the healthcare industry. I was told two days ago that a COVID patient started to code and the nurse rushed in to perform CPR and she was told to stop because there's a new law coming into existence that says not to resuscitate COVID patients because it puts healthcare workers at increased risk. Wait, what? <laughs> what did you say? Because that's not what I was taught in school. I was taught we were called to help people. We signed up to help save people's lives just as a soldier signed up to fight and nurses signed up to save people's lives and much more importantly than all of that is this truth those that are called to serve the king are called to do the work of the king and not to shrink back in fear of a virus or death or the mandate of man you've been commissioned by the king to do the will of God and the work of God is it possible for you to get sick yes it's possible even to die uh, yes but your life is not your own you've been bought with a price the price was the blood of Jesus and we either believe this story or we don't so be careful but not anxious precautious but not paralyzed Put Put your mask on. If you got to put your mask on, put your mask on. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not making a joke. Don't think that I'm making a joke. I'm being serious. If you got to put your mask on, put your mask on. I'm not saying that the re I can't breathe with this mask on right now. I'm not saying that the reason that China's numbers are lower than ours is because they're wearing the mask. That's not what I'm saying. They might even be lying about their numbers. But they got three times more people than us, and now we got more cases than they do. They might look silly and full of fear. I'm talking about being precaution. What you going to do if the brother, you're walking down the street, and he says, I really need prayer, but I don't want you to pray for me because I'm fearful that you might not be showing symptoms. So if you had a mask and some hand sanitizer, then I would let you come over here and I would let you lay hands on me. What are you going to say? Oh, no, brother, you're not going to restrict my faith. No, you're going to put the mask on. You're going to put some hand sanitizer on your hand and you're going to pray for the brother. You're going to pray the prayer of faith and you're going to believe, hallelujah, that he's going to be healed. All right. Amen. Listen to me, child of God. Don't get so arrogant in our faith that we can't be used to the Lord. Be precautious once again, but not paralyzed. Let's do the work of the Lord. God's called us, hallelujah, for such a time as this. Yes. In the story, we have a shift. Haman is the type of the Antichrist, the system of Antichrist, otherwise known as Mystery Babylon, says you will obey, you will bow, you will give reverence to this Haman and Mordecai, and the child of God says, I will not bow. The reason why you ask, because he was a Jew, he belonged to God. He had access to the word of God. He had a cloud of witnesses that had gone before him and he refused to bow. He's not the only one. Daniel refused to bow and he survived the lion's den. Let's look at Daniel real quick. Because I want to talk to you about them three Hebrew boys real quick. Because I want to show you that this same Holy Spirit has been, he's been saying the same thing. He, the Holy same, same Holy Spirit been saying the same thing that I'm trying to, that the Lord's trying to tell me to say right here today. Look at this. Nebuchadnezzar, he's a type of a he's a type of Antichrist too. Nebuchadnezzar, Goliath, Haman, all of these characters, types of Antichrist, trying to strike fear in the hearts of God's people. Nebuchadnezzar said, he spoke and said unto them, Is it true? You remember the story behind this? Nebuchadnezzar built a golden image that has all kind of number six up in there, which is the number six six six, the number of man. It's a type, you can't make this stuff up. And he said, we're going to parade this thing down the street, an image of the beast out of Revelation. And we're going to parade this thing down the street. We're going to play music. And when you hear the music, you're going to bow down to the image. But you know what? The three Hebrew boys said, no, we're not. 
<laughs> We're not bowing down to the image. I'm trying to prepare you, church. I'm trying to prepare you for a time frame, whether it is today, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's 10 years down the road. I'm trying to prepare you for a time change whenever the climate may change and the authorities may begin to tell you things that are contrary to what the word of the Lord says. Hey, it's one thing not to come to church. Come on, man. We don't want to spread the virus. If they're telling us not to do it, we're not going to do it. We don't want to hurt our fellow man. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hurt, especially I don't want to hurt the unbeliever. If he doesn't, if he's scared that I'm going to give him the virus, I don't want that brother to, he may not have the faith that I have. I understand what I'm getting into, child of God. I understand that I may take my last breath here and my first breath there, but I'm not trying to mess up the dude that doesn't understand anything. I'm not trying to take him out just because he doesn't have the faith that I have. Lord, help me. He says, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, look at this. He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to give you one more chance. If you're ready, look at this. And at the time that you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack with the psaltery and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, then it'll be okay. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Uh-oh. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful. And and one translation says we don't really have to defend ourselves in this. We're going to go ahead and give you an answer. We're going to respect you. But let me explain to you why, okay? To answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. You ain't the last one. You ain't got the last say so, king. He said, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But, (laughs) help us, Lord. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Even if he doesn't deliver us, king, we're not going to bow down to mystery Babylon system, system of Antichrist, where Mordecai is not going to bow down to Haman. Why? Because he's a Jew, because he's a child of God, and there's only one that's worthy to be worshipped. There's only one that's worthy to be reverenced. Look at this. Look at verse 19. Look how quick society will change on you. Ready? All you churches out there that have been the pillar of your community. You've been helping everybody with your Easter egg hunts and all that other kind of stuff. And you've been doing all this community service. And the community loves you. And the mayor gave you a key to the city. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage, his facial expression changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And therefore he spoke and commanded that they should heat the fiery furnace one seven times more than it was warm want to be heated. There's coming a day, church, whenever you're not going to be welcomed by your community anymore. If you don't go along with what they're telling you, if you don't do what it is that they say for you to do, and I'm talking about right now we're not even there. Right now we're just trying to help our fellow man to not spread the disease. But there may, there's going to come a day, and I don't know when it is, whenever the system of Antichrist is going to tell you to bow down to what their new order is. They're going to tell you that you're going to do what it is that they're demanding you to do, or you're going to be considered an outcast of society. You're going to be considered a problem for society. And this king that you choose to serve, he's not king anymore. No, it's a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm here to tell you, you cannot bow, child of God. You cannot bow. It's the truth of the gospel. Hallelujah. So we've been taught by the word of God that we are to repent and submit to the authorities and powers that be because God has allowed powers to be put in place in order for evil to be contained. However, through the ages, the powers that be have attempted to elevate themselves above the throne of God. All these occurrences, the spirit of Antichrist has shown itself. So the people of God in those days were faced with a challenge and they withstood the system and gave the church an example of what is to happen should we ever face such an occurrence. 
What must be understood is that this same spirit of Antichrist has been working from the time of the Tower of Babel, has continued to work until the end when Mystery Babylon and Revelation 17 and 18, the systems of false religion and corrupt governments and the beast's monetary system will all be destroyed in the end. And along the way, God used simple people like some little Hebrew boys named Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, a young shepherd boy named David to stand up in the face of the giant that tried to strike God people with fear and an old insignificant Jew named Mordecai that nobody even knew. They all withstood the spirit of Antichrist and the fear that it tried to impose on God's people and they said, no, not today, Satan. I will not bow. If I die today, I will die in service to my king. Mm. Esther chapter 3. You still with me? Yes. Hang in there, ch children of God. Well, I'm not going to keep you here much longer. <laughs> Esther chapter 3, verse 8. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. You shouldn't really put up with them, king, because they're causing problems in your kingdom. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hand of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. The king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given to you, the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. And there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province. And to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus, was it written and sealed with the king's ring. <coughs> it's not a virus, it's an allergy. <laughs> and the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, and the city Shushan was perplexed. It was full of confusion. It was full of, it was being troubled. These people say they serve God and not the current king. It's not what's best for your kingdom, sir, to allow them to continue. Instead, you must have them all killed if they refuse to submit to your will. See, that was point number two. When the spiritual climate changes, you've been called. I got to tell you something, child of God. You've been called. You've been prepared. Point number three for such a time as this. Esther chapter four. Verses 1 through 4. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, he ripped his clothes. He put sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city. And he cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains who he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. See, she didn't, Mordecai, that's what the Jewish people would do. They would rip their clothing. They would clothe themselves with sackcloth. They would rub ashes and describe great mourning and describe great repentance. Many of us have been quoting that scripture. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, that he would heal our land. Amen. When Mordecai saw what was going on, he, he desired to repent. He desired to mourn. He desired to cry out to God. Lord, give us a spirit of Mordecai that we would cry out to you. Hallelujah. See, God knows the hearts of his people better than they know their own hearts. When people are faced with great peril and concern for their own lives, 
The answer is not to turn to drugs, alcohol, or any other thing that will turn their hearts and away, eyes away from what they're supposed to do. The people of God are supposed to cry out and repent, turn to Him for strength and wisdom that His will for their lives will come to pass. I want you to see, I'm, 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 I'm wrapping it up. Just, just bear with me here. Verse 7. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him. He's telling this chamberlain, this, this servant. And of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her, to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spoke unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that what so, whosoever, whether man, now this is Esther responding. Whatever man or woman comes into the king, into the inner court, who has not been called, there is a law of the kings to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I, see Esther's a little concerned now. She says, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Let's keep reading. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you altogether hold your peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm closing my message this morning. I want you to know that God has prepared his people for such a time as this. A couple of points to be made before we close this week's message. Number one, God will find a vessel that he can use to proclaim his news in his kingdom. Yes. The enemy will always attempt through fear to shut the mouth of God's servant. I was remembering as I was working on this message 15 years ago. I was jogging yesterday at the track at Morgan City. And I can remember exactly where I was and who I was talking to. I was talking to my brother-in-law on the phone. It was about, it was anywhere from 15 to 18 years ago. And I was walking through the same gate to go jog on the same track. And I was telling my brother-in-law that what the Lord showed me, was showing me at that moment in time, I hadn't, I didn't have a church. I don't even know for sure if our Bible study was, was, had started yet. This is what the Lord showed me. There will come a day when preaching my word will no longer be a cool job. Mm -hmm. with a good salary and great hours. Mm -hmm. And then we will see how they respond. Oh. The Lord prepared my heart for that. The Lord told me way in advance. I'm not even saying that we're there. Maybe tomorrow it'll be a cool job again. I don't really know what tomorrow holds, but I'll tell you this. The Lord has definitely spoken to my heart. And he told me there's coming a day when being a preacher of the gospel is not going to be a cool job anymore. When being a pastor is not going to be a cool job anymore. Where you got an expense account. Where you got a nice little salary. And where you got this groovy little schedule that, just, that you can just arrange it any way you want to. And the question is, how will people respond when that day comes? But God has been, been preparing his people for such a time as this. That's the word that the Lord would speak to you this morning. Fear not. The Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Yes. Know that the Lord has prepared his service for such a time as this yes. to be vessels that would proclaim the truth of king and kingdom. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word speaks your truth. Lord God, we thank you for the prophetic gifts. Lord God, we ask that you would go before us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. That you would fill us up with your Holy Spirit. That you'd yes, fill us up with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord God, that you'd give us the strength that we need, Lord God, to be heroes of the faith at such a time as this. Lord God, that great uh, social problems have arisen throughout the kingdom age. Lord God, and it's on that backdrop that you have allowed your people to yes, shine, Lord yes, God, like never yes. before. And so we pray, Lord God, that we would be a mouthpiece of truth. Yes. We pray that we would be a vessel of hope. We pray, Lord God, that our lives would show forth and shine the glory of God. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. Be blessed this week. 
We're going to trust the Lord for your finances, for your physical health, for your emotional well-being. Amen. And listen, don't forget, 2.30, we have children's ministry. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hallelujah.